going to use the following a little bit of recap of this angular equivalent um, notion because it's probably still new for you. So I'll write a few things just to summarize what we did yesterday. And I'll make some remarks and I will do one very lengthy proof. Um, but bear with me, I'll try to make it as, as clear as possible and as exciting as possible. <laughs> okay, so um, yesterday we we looked at things uh, like this, access is equipped with two norms in there. Uh, we say that the two norms are angularly equivalent. On the board, I will write it as capital A dot capital E dot instead of little A, little E, because then you'll be confused with almost everywhere. So let's not do that. So I will use this notation rather. Um, if there exists a C such that you have this inequality relating the tangent of uh, the angle from x to y with respect to the second norm and the angle, the norm angle with respect to the first norm. Right. And we saw yesterday, oh so, sorry, this holds for all non-zero x and y. Um, and we saw yesterday that after symmetry, after we prove the symmetry, this constant is necessarily greater than one. Okay. So yeah. This is what we had yesterday, and uh, what did we know? Um, well, first of all, we show that topological sorry, angular equivalence implies topological equivalence. The converse is not true in general. Uh, we know one case where the converse is true for inner product induced. I mean to say inner product norms. Okay, that we know. Um, also, yesterday I mentioned that if you have x with 1, so to get 1 and 2 oops, on x, they are angularly equivalent, then this is strictly convex if and only if guy is strictly convex, right? The same holds true for uniformly convex, but then we use a different it's also true. So the notion of angular equivalence preserves convexity, yeah? Um, unlike topological equivalence. Okay, and what else did I mention yesterday? Oh, very important, right? Um, so we have, again on x, on x, 1 and 2, uh, angularly equivalent, and we can create, we can construct another norm there, right? Uh, so this guy, which is at 1 and 2, uh, is, is also uh, angularly equivalent to norm 1 and norm 2. We did this uh, well, we did a proof, but the proof actually is not too complicated. Um, you just have to cleverly play around with your with your um, g functional so that it can always be <coughs> these these tangents. So one, once you can compute, that's what you need to do first, right? You need to compute this tangent for the third norm, and then some terms involving the first one and the second one will pop out, and then you use the fact that they're angular equivalent. Not, not too complicated, but. Okay, and remember yesterday I comment on I commented on the importance of this example is that now we have actually a concrete example of something that is not in this case, right? Um, we're in our product norm uh, that angularly equivalent to something that is a non-inner product. So that's a very important example. Okay, um, two more comments relating to this. Well, if you look at this, I'm, I'm, I'm adding two things, right? Well, I, I can also do, okay, what about the following norm? If I construct a new norm taking the maximum of 1 and 2, is this guy still angularly equivalent to the first uh, original 2? The answer is no. Unfortunately. Okay, so yes, if you add them, if you take maximum, the answer is no. And of course, then you can ask something like, what about I construct a norm like this? 
This is 1, this is 2, and I take 1 over p, or p greater than 1 and finite. Is this still actually equivalent to the origin? Uh, I don't know. I'm still in the process of answering this question. Uh, open problem. Um, yeah, so that's something to something to think about. Okay. All right. So um, let's see. Uh, I want to make a quick comment about the following. So recall that. Um, I'm just going to call it G plus and minus rather than having. Um, constructing the tangent function of a multiplier on something in the following. Um, so this is what normal vex uh, limit. We've done this for a few days now. Um, normal of x plus ty minus normal of x divided by t, right? Um, and how we construct g is basically this half of g plus and g minus. Arithmetic mean of the two, right? And <coughs> the, the, when they're equal, right? When they are equal, uh, then the space is smooth, right? <coughs> and then you just do, you don't have to compute this. Your g is basically just this limit, right? If I cover the plus and minus. So there's less things to calculate, right? That's, that's what I'm saying. Okay. So if you suppose the left hand side limit and the right hand side limit is not the same. Then first you have to compute g plus, and then you have to compute g minus, and then you have to compute g, and then you have to do cos, and then you have to do tan, a lot of things to compute, right? Um, but we're able to show the following. So initially our work, when we started working with this, we, to avoid um, lengthy calculations, we only work on smooth spaces. So that very, if you manage to see the very first draft of our paper, everything is smooth so that we have less calculation. But of course we were not satisfied, right? If they're not smooth, then how do you cover all these? Are the results still so true? Um, turns out, we're able to show the following, so theorem. This is a very nice theorem in my opinion, uh, in one sense, and not very nice in another sense, and I will explain why. Okay, so on x, um, again we have one and two norm. Okay, uh, to show that, I'll just say both norms are uh, angularly equivalent the same, that way, um, with constant c. Maybe. With constant c, meaning this inequality holds for all non-zero x and y, um, it is enough to verify that the same inequality uh, holds. So it, it, it is enough to verify this for pairs of vectors um, satisfying G, I mean to say GI plus XY is equal to gi minus xy for i equals 1 and 2. Okay. Um, so, meaning what? If you can show it for a smooth point, then you're done. Right? So, if you, if you look at your little L1, these are the non smooth points, you can forget about it. So, you only show it for um, the smooth points. Then you can show that they're angular. Meaning, what everything that we've done for smooth spaces, now we can carry over to non-smooth spaces. So this is quite nice result. So you don't have to worry about the non-smooth points. You only have to care about uh, the smooth points. Um, however, I think <laughs> the bad news here is that um, it's seeming like seemingly like this angular equivalence notion is blind, quotation mark, um, 
when it comes to stimulus. Meaning, if I want to show something like this, instead of these properties, smoothness and uniform smoothness, it's very difficult. Because using this, right, it sort of cannot distinguish the non-smooth points and the smooth points. So it's actually quite complicated. So we don't know how to prove that if I, if I change this to smooth or uniform smoothness. So I don't know. There's another open problem. That do they preserve smoothness? It's quite difficult because of this. Um, okay, but nonetheless, there are other things that we can do. Okay, so let's see. So I will, for the next few minutes, I hope, I want to show you how to prove that theorem for uniformly convex. Not all the proof, but some of the ingredients of the proof, and maybe sketch of the main proof. Okay. So we want to show that if you have two angular equivalent norms, the, uh, the, the one is uniformly convex, and the other one is uniformly convex. Okay. And in order to do that, um, let's recall again the definition of um, uniform convexity. Okay. How does the definition look like? Um, X is uniformly convex if for all epsilon positive, there exists delta positive such that if x and y are on the unit sphere and their distance is at least epsilon, then uh, x plus y is less than or equal to 1 minus one. Okay. Um, yes. Uh, our the way we are going to show this is to recharacterize uniform convexity using tangent. Okay. So theorem x is uniformly convex if and only if for all x one positive still the same. There exists delta positive still the same. If um, such that if x and y are on the unit sphere and still the same, their distance is at least epsilon, then now it changes. Tangent theta xy divided by 2 is greater or equal to delta. That's what we want to uh, prove today. Okay, I want to prove Okay, so later on, once we have this theorem, so anytime we see uniformly convex, we use, we make use of this tangent so that to calculate our, to take care of this definition that it's, it's, it's a lot more, right? It's like, okay. So this proof is somewhat lengthy, but um, very good. Okay, so let's try to prove this. Remember, we have to prove an if and only if statement. So x is uniformly convex, meaning we have this, we're going to show this, and the other way around, yeah? Okay. So, is that a new way? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's not get confused between which delta is which. This is uh, basically the problem in the room. Okay, so it has to be very, very clear, because the two statements are almost similar, only different here, right? Okay. All right, so assume x is uniformly convex, meaning I have the epsilons and the deltas for these guys, yeah? Okay, so assume x is uh, uniformly convex, and then we're going to choose, sorry, fix epsilon positive, and choose eta positive, such that um, x plus y divided by 2 is less than or equal to 1 minus eta when never x, y is on the unit sphere and the distance between these two guys are at least absolute. So I'm using the definition of uniform convexity, but I choose eta. And I will name that guy delta at some point. Okay, so 
You will see why I'm choosing this delta when we get there. Set delta to be root epsilon. Okay. So if x and y have length one, right? Um, and still x y is greater than epsilon. What do we have? Oh, sorry. I need something. Where can I write this? Maybe up here. I need a different <coughs> quality that I will use a lot. Okay. Um, another exercise that you can show is that you always have the following inequality: minus y norm y is less than or equal to norm of x minus norm of x minus y less than or equal to g minus x y divided by norm of x less than or equal to g plus x y divided by norm of x, less than or equal to x plus y minus x. Is that true? Yes. Less than or equal to y. Okay. Um, to prove this, use the fact that the mapping from t to this is non-decreasing. Prove that. Okay. So for all x, this is true. Okay. So once I have this, I'm going to use this inequality. Which one I'm going to use? I'm going to use this part from here up to there. I will also need that one, but I don't need this part. Okay, so I'm going to ignore this part. And x and y has norm 1 now, so what do I have? From, let's call it star. Okay, from star, I have minus y, which is minus 1, less than or equal to, I can say actually g x y, right? Because g is the arithmetic mean of the two, it will still be between um, all those terms of the norms, right? And then less than or equal to, yeah, because the, the g will sit in between the minus and the plus, right? So this is fine. Okay. Uh, less than or equal to x plus y minus 1, so I'm using this, right? Less than or equal to 1. Okay. Now, I'm there. I'm looking at now my tangent theta x, y divided by 2, by definition, is root 12. Not by definition, by our trigonometric identity, and then using g, definition of cos. Right? I have something like this. Well, actually, divided by norm of x, norm of y, because it's cos, but they're wrong. So we have something simple like this. Okay, now I'm going to use the fact that from here you can conclude that if I add 1 to g of xy, and I'm looking at the last term, I will have that this is less than 2. Right? So the reciprocal will be greater than 2. Right? So I have this guy will be greater than root 1 minus gxy divided by 2. Yes? Okay. And this will be greater than, okay, now we have to be careful again. I'm going to do the following. I'll use 1 minus that. Okay, let's, let's do it here. Careful. I have uh, minus gxy is less than or equal to, sorry, that one, greater than or equal to, I'm sorry, um, minus, whoa, minus this, so 1 minus x plus y, and then I'm going to add 1, so this becomes 2, right? Okay, so I have something like this, and I'm going to apply it there, right? For the numerator. So this guy is greater than root of 2 minus x plus y divided by 2, or in other words, 1 minus this, right? Okay, we're getting closer, right? We're going to use this. We're getting closer. Okay, that is what? x plus y divided by 2, less than or equal to 1 minus eta. 
Or if I move 1 minus x plus y divided by 2, this will be greater or equal to eta. Um, is that what I want? Yes. Right? So this will be greater or equal to root eta. And this is my double that I've said to you. So what did we just prove? We have this. And tangent theta x, y over 2 is greater or equal to delta, as required. There is this delta. OK. One side of the implication, though. I don't need this anymore. OK. The reason I chose this proof is because I think it's nice to um, show you how would one work with uniform convexity, the definition, and also the definition of angular equivalence. So, uh, sorry, uh, not the definition of angular equivalence, rather how to work with this G concerning um, thetas and, and tangent and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, a lot of calculation, <laughs> but it's okay. All right, so reverse implication, the converse of this one is going that way. Now we want to prove the other way. Okay, so now we assume that this whole thing is true. We want to show that the space is uniformly convex. Okay, so let's write our assumption. Fix epsilon positive. Choose, again, I'm going to use eta for the guy at the bottom, and I will choose delta so that we have something like this. Okay, choose eta positive, such that if norm of x equals norm of y, which is 1, so they're on the unit sphere, and now I will make their distance greater or equal to epsilon over 4, right? You will see why later on, right? Okay, then from our assumption, tangent theta x y divided by 2 is greater or equal to eta. So I choose eta in such a way that I have this whole satisfying function. Okay, so we have that as our, our assumption. Now I'm going to set delta to be something quite complicated, but it's okay. Eta squared divided by 1 plus eta squared epsilon over 4. Again, you will see why we choose such a delta. Okay, now let's try to prove it. Suppose we take x and y on the unit sphere, and their distance is at least epsilon. Okay, and now set, I'm going to call x plus y to be z for simplicity. And what do we want to show? We want to show that z over 2. Already said. Okay. Uh, easy case. If z is zero, then I'm done, right? If z is zero, then the norm that I want to compute is zero. So this is less than or equal to one minus delta. Why? Because of how I construct my delta, right? You're taking minimum of these these two guys. This is less than one because of this. Well, what about this one? Well, what, what, whichever is large is always taking minimum, right? <coughs> so this is not negative. So I'm done. This is true. Okay, so um, that we are for this case. Easy case. Okay, otherwise, I will look at this complicated thing, but it's okay. You will see the reason why. 2 minus that normal z, sorry, x minus normal z, z divided by normal z minus x. Okay, this is what? Well, let's see. I'm actually adding something to get, adding nothing to get something again. Um, you will see what happened, right? Okay, so this guy is minus z x, normal z times x. Over here you have minus z, normal z minus x. So they will cancel. So I'm end, I ended up with 2x from here, 
Okay? This z and that z cancel to x minus z. Right? Who is z? Z is x minus y. Sorry, x plus y. So this is simply x minus y, which I know is greater than epsilon because of this. Right? Okay. So the idea here is instead of working with x minus y greater than epsilon, I'm going to work with this normal, with z and x. Okay? Right. So now I'm going to use the fact that if I have um, no, if I have u and v greater or equal to epsilon, it's not too difficult to show that um, u is greater or equal to epsilon over 2, or v is greater or equal to epsilon over 2. Okay, so I'm going to look at one case one way, another case one way from here with my choice of u and v to be these guys. This is u, and this is v. Okay. Are we still okay? <laughs> Great. All right, so let's see case one. Uh, actually, case 2a, it doesn't matter. Uh, so if, if 2 minus, what was it? Um, normal z times x is greater or equal to epsilon over 2, then what do we have? Well, this is scalar. Z is what? X plus y, right? Z is x plus y. You apply triangle inequality. Its norm is less than 2. So this is positive, non-negative. 2 minus norm z, norm x, greater than epsilon over 2. Yes? So we have what? Um, let's be careful here. Uh, normal x is 1. So I have this. Yeah? So now brackets can go away. So I have that normal z is, so z goes that way, right? Um, is less than or equal to 2 minus epsilon over 2. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. And I'm going to divide by 2. This becomes 1. This becomes epsilon over 4. Right? So here already I have my x plus y divided by 2. Right? I want this. Yes? But check that epsilon over 4 and connect it to our delta. So delta um, is less than or equal to epsilon over 4. So 1 minus epsilon over 4 is less than or equal to 1 minus 3. Right? So this guy is less than or equal to 1 minus 3. Okay. So I'm done with this case. Yeah? 1 minus 3. Alright. Last case. Last case is that guy. So let me just take the normal z out already. Or no, maybe not. Normal z times z divided by normal z minus x. Everything with the norm, greater or equal to epsilon over 2. Okay, this implies what? Um, so if this, then we have, let's multiply it in. We have z divided by normal z. Um, wait, I'm making a mistake. This Z, I think, here. Oh, no, that's not what I want. I do want the Z out. That's what I want. I'm sorry. Okay, so I have norm of Z divided by norm of Z minus X. Yeah? Greater or equal to epsilon over 2Z. I can do this because... Where is it? Um, now Z is not good, right? Okay. Alright, so I have that. Okay. Um, but remember, normal Z, as we concluded earlier, is less than or equal to 2. Right? So this guy is greater or equal to epsilon over 
four. Yes? Mm -hmm. Okay, so now I will use this one. Yeah, I have something on the unit sphere, Z divided by normal Z, and Y, another something on the unit sphere, greater than or equal to epsilon over four. So I know the tangent for those two guys will be greater than E tangent, right? So that's what I'm going to use. Okay, so here I know now that my tangent theta z divided by normal z, comma y, comma x, sorry, <coughs> divided by 2 is greater or equal to e tangent, right? And what is this? This is root 1 minus g z divided by normal z, comma x divided by the same thing, but with a plus, and now I have this guy is greater than two. Right? So I'm there. Okay. So let's have a look at this and do a little bit of algebra. So I'm going to shorthand this guy to G, just so that my algebra is easy. So I have this, it's greater or equal to eta squared. Yes? 1 minus G is eta squared 1 plus G. Okay? And then what do I do after that? I do, let's see, um, this is 1 minus G greater or equal to eta squared plus eta squared G. Right? I want to move my eta squared to the other side and gather everything with G on that side. Right? So 1 minus eta squared and then eta squared plus 1 times G. On negative, g is less than or equal to 1 minus eta squared and 1 plus eta squared. Okay? I'm going to use that. So after some calculation, I have that g z divided by norm of z, comma x, is less than or equal to 1 minus eta squared, 1 plus eta squared. Okay, so, yes. Alright, and then, what do I do from here? I'm going to use star again. But now, instead of x and y, I will use z and x. Okay? So I'll have from here norm of z minus norm of z minus x. So I apply it for z and x. Yeah? Less than or equal to g z divided by norm of z. x divided by norm of, well, norm of this. Z divided by normal Z. Right? So it's wrong. Sorry. Okay, so I'm here now. We're almost up. Okay, so let's see. Where can I write? So we have Z minus, what is Z minus X? Z is X plus Y. Minus x again? Y. y. Alright, so we have that. Um, is less than or equal to g of z divided by norm of z. But norm of y is 1, right? And I'm, I'm going to move it to the other side. So I have this. Yeah? Okay, now I'm looking at z over 2, which is the term that I want because my Z is x plus y, right? You want to go here. So x plus y over 2, z over 2 is less than or equal to, well, this guy divided by 2. I'm going to write it the following way. Half times 1 plus g z over z, normal z, x. Yeah? And now I'm going to use this guy. Yeah? So, Less than or equal to what? 1 over 2, 1 plus 1 minus eta squared, 1 plus eta squared. Let's calculate this quickly. Here we have 1 plus eta squared, plus 1 minus eta squared. So eta squared cancel, we get 2 on the top, 2 on the 2 cancel, so we have this. But you can also write this as, is that right? 1 plus eta squared. Whoops, no, we need to test for it. That's what I'm There you go. 
1 plus eta squared, eta, eta cancel, you have 1. So this is correct. But hold on. Again, like before, right? That guy is less than delta. Sorry, delta is less than that guy. So this is less than 1 minus the delta. Hurrah. We are done. OK. It's long. <laughs> it's long. OK. Um, so now, after this lengthy calculation, then if I want to prove that the two angular equivalent norms are, uh, sorry, if you have two angular equivalent norms, one is uniformly convex and the other one is uniformly convex, it is easier to have something that already expressed in terms of tangent. Okay. Um, that theorem I'm not going to prove because it is again quite lengthy, but the length is actually just details, right? I'm going to just mention some of the key ingredients. Where can I do this? Let's, let's read this one, because I still need it, just to make my comment. Right? Okay. Um, so, to prove that if you have two angularly equivalent norm on x, then x with this guy is uniformly convex if and only if this guy is uniformly convex. Well, you don't really have to prove if and only if. You only need to prove one side, right? And then to prove the other side, just reverse the roles of one and two in your And then you're done. Actually, you only need to prove one side. So the problem here is, right, when you try to apply this theorem, then you say, okay, I have, for example, I assume it is uniformly convex with the first norm. Then you apply this characterization. So what do you do? You say, okay, now I have for all x one, there is a delta such that if x and y, with respect to the first norm, is on the unit sphere, then you have the rest. Right? The problem is, if x and y are on the unit sphere of the one norm, it is not necessarily that it's also on the unit sphere with respect to the second norm. So in some sense, you have to sort of scale it and then get uh, the fact that you can, after scaling, the tangent obviously doesn't, doesn't change, right? So if you have angle of, of two vectors like this, mm -hmm. if it's a bit extended, mm -hmm. it is also fine, okay? Mm -hmm. So you have to do some uh, clever sort of uh, scaling, quote unquote, so that you get some uh, multiple of this that will lie on the unit sphere of the second one. And over there, you will use this inequality. Dunkle Williams inequality. This is exactly um, the inequality that you need to do scale. If you look at the statement, I'm not going to write it down, uh, but if you try to Google this and you get a statement for Dunkle Williams inequality, it's always stated with x divided by norm x minus y divided by norm y. So this is perfect for uh, scaling. Uh, <coughs> so ingredient is this plus Dunkle Williams inequality. Start with unit sphere with the first norm, you scale it down to the uh, sorry, you look at it with respect to the second norm, you scale it up and down, doesn't matter, so that now you have things on the unit sphere of the second one, and then the rest is just easy, because you're just applying some inequalities, and then you will get it in terms of, of C and such. Okay. Are we okay? Okay, so I'm not going to prove this. Basically, we need this and the other. Okay. Right. Let me clean which side of the board. Which side of the board. For my final work. Okay. So this work is still new in the sense that you can ask all sorts of questions. Take two norms, are they angularly equivalent? What kind of norms? Etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So for example, I'm still working on at the moment, um, if I have two angularly equivalent norms, if one is uniformly non-square, is the other one uniformly non-square? I think I'm close, but I made a slight mistake in my proof, which I still need to fix. But there are many uh, problems that, that you can state. Okay. So for my final one, I'm just going to make comment about dual spaces. Okay. 
So if I have two norms, uh, angular equivalent on x, now I'm going to look at the dual norm of 1 and the dual norm of 2. Are they angularly equivalent on x? That's the question. So start with something that's angularly equivalent, take the dual norms, are they still angularly equivalent on x? The answer is no. And I will give you an example. Okay, so the example says follows. I'm going to take in R2 the following norm. Something in R2. The first norm is 2 x to the C psi and x to the eta. The second one is similar, but I'm swapping the quote. Okay, so if you try to draw the unit circles of these two, right, it will look like this. One looks like this. So like in the L1 norm, but the vertices will just, will just squash it this way. And the other one, let's use a different pen, is this one. Okay. So, so good candidate for something that is angularly equivalent. Remember, if you have angularly equivalent norms and you look at their unit circles, they should lie the same way. The converse may not be true, so we still have to check whether these guys are angular. But good candidate, because at least on the picture, almost right. Okay, so we we need to we need to check. Them. Okay, uh, to check this, you simply calculate. Do I still have time? Let's see. Until. Six, seven, okay, I think I still have time. <laughs> All right, so let's see. We have. If I look at norm of y two multiply with 1 minus g of x, y, g, this should be g2, Wait, let me just make sure, yeah, g2, x, y, okay, it's norm of y2, and you can make quick calculation of what the g is, it should look like the g for the little l1 norm, you just have some weight here and there, right, so this is equal to norm of x, uh, Sine mu wait. Um, actually, let me just skip this calculation because I'm worried that this is going to get too long. Um, let me just give you the final calculation. You can check the paper or um, ask me later where this is coming from for exercise. Um, <laughs> if you compute your tangent, Right? I don't want to bore you with this really lengthy calculation. Um, you will get, erase my picture, although it's a nice picture, this one. Um, I have absolute value of mu minus mu sine psi plus 2, oh, what is mu and mu? Oh, sorry. I have to say x is um, psi and eta and y is mu mu is very up oh, there. Alright, two times this guy minus two mu sine eta divided by similar thing but a little plus. Okay. Now we simply just going to well, I want two here and one here, right? I want two, two, one, one, two, two, one, one, so that I can write it as tangent square theta one over two. Because these two guys only differ by the coefficient, right? But if you look at this term, right? Because of how it's constructed, there's a mu and mu times something that is maybe zero, maybe one, maybe negative one. This is not negative, so I can increase that by how many? Do, how many do I want to increase this by? By four, I think. Yes. Increase that by 4. So I have 4 of something plus 2 of something divided by 
uh, here I'm going to leave this guy and then I decrease this to half. Same argument, right? Now I'm going to do there, right? And now what I'm going to do is the following. I'm going to take two out, so that now I have two and one. And I'm going to take half out, so then I have again two and one, right? So this will give me my tangent of the other, right? And this gives me four, oh, equal to four, sorry. And this whole thing, if you make, apply the same calculation, you will get tangent squared theta one over two, angular over two. Okay, um, but we don't need this anymore. Um, okay, so the original two norms are angularly equivalent to each other, confirmed by the picture that we saw earlier. Right but what about their dual norms? What are their dual norms? So the dual norm of the first guy is an L-infinity type. So if you make this calculation, you will get that the dual norm of the first guy looks something like this. Okay? So like an L-infinity norm, not quite, but it's okay. And the second one is similar, only now the half moves to the other side, right? Okay, now, it's time to draw pictures. How does the norms of these guys look like? One of them, so this is L infinity type, right? L infinity look like a square, but one you squash it like this, and one you squash it like this. So you will have something that looks like that and something that looks like this. And you can see polygons still, but they don't have the same way. So this cannot be angularly equivalent by the corollary that I mentioned yesterday, right? Yeah, two angular equivalent norms. They should be still polygon. If one of them is polygon, the other one is still polygon. But they should lie on the same way, like the picture earlier with the This is fine. Everything is on the x-axis and the y-axis, but not this one. Okay. So unfortunately for uh, dual norms, the answer is not. But it's okay. It is what it is, right? So um, lots of things you can ask. It's easy to ask the question. Maybe not so easy to answer the to answer the question, right? You can I don't know. Take whatever two norms somewhere. I don't know. You want to add them. You want to do whatever you like. Are they the angular equivalent norms? Are they do they preserve how many geometrical properties that you want to check? Uniform norm squareders, uniform L N1 maybe, <laughs> and all of these questions. I don't know, but this I think is still new and lots of things that we can discover. So I hope um, if you're interested, uh, do talk to me. Um, and thank you very much for the last few days. Uh, for patiently listening to my to my work <laughs> and my long calculations, um, and thank you for the opportunity, especially to find out.